Hello everyone. Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to introduce our next keynote speaker for the day. Uh, with us we have Johnny Penn, who is a professor at the University of Cambridge, is a number one New York best-selling author, and interestingly enough, he's also starred in a TV show in MTV. So, <laughs> we have a lot of connection with MTV. Please give it up for Johnny Penn. Guys, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, to have the opportunity to speak with you now, but to get to know some of you last night over dinner and to, to understand a bit more about the work that you do in the world. I'm going to talk today about my journey into the AI universe. It's been a strange one. And um, I'm going to start with a, uh, a graph you may have seen before. This is the kind of popular image of artificial intelligence that's caught in the news starting in around the 2010s popularized by uh, uh, a man named Nick Bostrom at University of Oxford. And the idea here is as calculation becomes more affordable, you see on the, on the graph here that you know, calculations per second per $1,000, we're going to go into this inflection point where intelligence becomes kind of recursively self-improving and you know, we will be to this AI what like a golden retriever is to us. It'll kind of tap us on the head and encourage us. And, <laughs> feed us and things like that. Now, this has been described as the intelligence explosion, right? I'm going to tell you why this is kind of part of the story, but as for reasons you've actually seen today, it is not the whole story by any stretch. But to do there, I need to go kind of back in history a little bit, about to the midway point of my journey into the AI universe, as to 2018. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, Los Angeles, in Long Beach, actually, for this major machine learning conference. And uh, you know you're at an AI conference because there's a lineup for the men's bathroom. Um, you know, it's, it's all engineers. We're all kind of geeks, just bumping shoulders, trying to figure out what the coolest stuff is that's happening. And uh, one of the speakers from a, te a team at, from Queen Mary University are showing their attempts to uh, model uh, this kind of primitive uh, video game. And you see here how a human player would play that game, and this was their result of having a, a, a system model it. And you can see immediately it's highly competent. Uh, when I saw this, I thought, you know, shit. Um, my, my kids will be unemployed forever. Um, you know, I better not start a family because how could you compete with this kind of superhuman ability? And I'll give you another example. This is on kind of maximum difficulty. And it still wins. And, and seeing this, I, you know, if for, for all of us, and this was, you know, almost a decade ago now, so it, uh, I'll go into what's happened since, but it was kind of a scary prospect, an exciting prospect, and Part of what you're seeing here is a high level of competency in a particular domain, right? So this is kind of pattern recognition on steroids. It's predicting where it ought to be given uh, you know, the, the, uh, the location of a threat, in this case the bombs dropped by the aliens, and trying to figure out how to win the game by playing multiple, you know, millions if not billions of times. And the idea here is, is to find the signature, in a sense, right? It's to find the, the way to kind of maximally uh, uh, compete. And what I want to go into now is, is how this laid the basis for the moment we're in now, the kind of generative AI moment. Because in generative AI and the creation of what's called synthetic media, you're also trying to develop uh, the signature of uh, whatever it is that you're kind of looking for. So one of the important areas of change in the, in the kind of mid-2000s to the late mid-2000s, or late 20, sorry, mid-2010s to late 2010s was synthetic imagery, uh, uh, buoyed in no small part by NVIDIA. So what you see here is from a database of human faces, and they wondered basically, in the same way that we've just programmed this, this system to, to kind of beat the game, could you find the signature of a human face? And you can see here, this is uh, generated by a model. You know, it, it's got a nose, it's got eyes, it's got a mouth. It's the, the data set was black and white, so the quality is comparable there. But as time passes, things get a bit better. This poor woman has kind of blonde hair on one side of her head and brown hair on the other. Uh, but, you know, each year there's, there's kind of marginal improvements. 
2017 was a sort of step change. This was a funny moment because uh, models, they realized uh, some of the best data out there was of celebrities. Uh, and so uh, this is, uh, you know, because celebrities' photos are taken in high quality with good lighting and with, you know, there's, a whole, there's just a lot of data out there of them. And so the jokes became like, what would this celebrity's name be if they existed? And then in 2018, we got to the point where it's basically equivalent with, uh, with looking like a human. Let's do a poll of the room quickly. Which do you think is the human, the real human, which is the fake human? So hands up for the one on this side. Hands up for the face on this side. I tricked you all. It is both are, are algorithmically generated. If you go to thisfacedoesnotexist.com, you can, you can refresh endlessly and see you know, countless number of these. But I've come to learn that that page is less popular than, I think it's thiscatdoesnotexist.com, <laughs> which the internet loves, uh, fake, fake cats. Um, so, so that's synthetic imagery, right? Synthetic media looking for, in this case, the signature of a face, like the signature of how to beat a game and allowing a model to just iteratively improve with, with better data to get to these remarkable outcomes. And already this is being uh, actioned on in the marketplace. You're going to start to see, you may not even notice, more and more fake influencers, some with massive accounts. There was a, an account of uh, uh, an influencer getting DM'd by a major footballer, and that influencer did not exist, so the team behind it had to say to this major footballer, you probably don't want to flirt with us. Um, <laughs> we're a corporation, not a, a pretty woman. Uh, uh, but you know, in your industry, as you're already starting to see uh, the, the kind of finish that sentence in imagery uh, mechanism is going to be used in all sorts of interesting ways, some of which were, that were just profiled, I think, do justice to this idea really, really vividly. Equally, you, know, you drop in line, line drawings and, and ask them to kind of finish that sentence for you and voila, it happens. And this is, you know, in the style of an Airbnb. This site exists, uh, pro or consumer, you could use this today if you wanted, interiors.ai, and you can ask it to style in whatever, you know, way you want, and they're working on v version two right now, which you can get in beta if you sign up. I get, I don't work for this company, by the way, it's just to, to show the, 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 the kind of how, how fast this is happening. Uh, it can work with blueprints too, uh, so you don't even need to have the kind of line drawings. It, it will it will render from blueprints with the with the newest version, um, and that's synthetic text. Or sorry, that's synthetic imagery. Now I want to turn to synthetic text. The fun part about this part of the description is it was a lot harder to tell this story pre-OpenAI and pre-ChatGPT uh, because people would look at me like I was crazy. Who here in the room has used ChatGPT or equivalent? Interesting. Did anybody use it for the, for the puzzle that you did yesterday? Okay. Tried. You tried. Okay, good. Because on the back of Greg's comments about, you know, uh, would it be useful, or the ways in which humans and machines compete and humans plus machines outcompete, you know, we are in the moment now where I, I sort of regret not taking part in using, using uh, uh, Claude. Uh, which is Anthropic's model, or uh, BARD, which is Google's, or ChatGPT, and, and see if it could be useful. You may have noticed, if you're really keenly attached to this, that Google's just announced last night their new Gemini model, which is multimodal. I'll explain what that means in a minute, but it's fascinating uh, just how quickly these things are not only happening, but are being uh, put out to market. Um, you know, generative text works on the same basic principle. It's, it's autocomplete on steroids. You're not predicting the next uh, uh, logical kind of pixel to put uh, in, in a, dis a display of an image, but in this case, you're trying to uh, predict what word ought to follow. And what we're finding is that there's all this kind of latent knowledge out there. Um, and, and one of the areas, I got to go to the World Economic Forum's uh, uh, kind of leadership in AI summit in San Francisco earlier this year, and it was Chatham House rules, so I can't say who said what, but a lot of the bigwigs, or one of the bigwigs at the, one of the major tech companies was speaking uh, really excitedly about this uh, in medicine, and working with cl clinicians to diagnose illnesses that, that they were stumped on, and saying, well, what if you put in the, you know, the full spread of what the patient's suffering through, into the, into the system and see what it can generate. And you can see an example here. This is from colleagues at the Harvard Medical School. 
uh, you know, and prompting it with enough detail, sufficient detail for the system to look through its database of, you know, 43 million papers from PubMed, which is, you know, medical papers, and saying, with this set of symptoms, it's likely that you may be experiencing this. Now, critical to uh, underline here, so nobody gets hurt, um, the, the, the way this jumps from, you know, promising to revolutionary is if it could be medically licensed. We are a long way off from that, in part because ChatGPT is also trained on Reddit uh, and a lot of the other kind of junkier parts <laughs> of the internet. And so, you know, you wouldn't want to necessarily take medical advice from, from these sources. Um, still, as a second opinion, and even for you know, veterinary medicine, you, we're starting to see this more and more that people are saying, what's going on with my dog? Uh, and putting in as much detail as they can. Now, as was true, as is true of Google and other uh, searches of you know, digital environments, a lot comes down to the quality of the prompt. Um, and it's worth becoming a kind of uh, amateur prompt engineer is the term that's being thrown around now, and, or a kind of LLM whisperer, a generative AI whisperer, and that means you, you have to kind of train your intuitions about how to elicit the material that you want, and you do have to kind of play with it a little bit and talk to it. And sometimes it'll say, I can't do that, and you can say back to it, yes, you can, and it'll say, you're right, I can do that. So, uh, it's strange, really, what we're finding. Uh, we kind of coaxes it forward. I've also just learned in the last week that you can bribe the system. Uh, if you encourage it, say, I'll give you a prize for this. It, it can sometimes do measurably better. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my guidance at this point just to these three kind of items, which is uh, it's useful to give it a role to say, you are this. You are a professor at the University of Cambridge. Then to give it a task saying, I want you to, I've just done this in the last week, comment on my 50 students' uh, feedback reports and tell me which students are, uh, no names, but which students uh, are, are all anonymized, need the most support. Uh, and then the format is, you know, put it in a spreadsheet, put it in a paragraph, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we've done synthetic imagery, we've done synthetic text, what's next? Well, actually, I'll, I'll give this example first, too, because it, it, uh, uh, in speaking with the organizers before this event, I offered to, to weigh in here and there about what I'd imagine would be happening in, in, in your guys' uh, part of uh, the world and in terms of industry. And, of course, this is being seized up by uh, major law firms to try and, you know, improve uh, uh, workflow for lower-tier workers in law firms as with the medical knowledge, you do still want someone at the wheel here, right? Uh, because you don't necessarily want to sign something that has just been kind of auto-complete, uh, uh, auto-completed. But still, this is a kind of an area that there is a gold rush. There's a lot of startups competing, and that competition, I think, will render uh, kind of useful uh, tools and is already slowly uh, getting us there. Equally, programming, you know, if you're a developer, you used to have to go to Stack Overflow, which is a repository of kind of guidance. Now, as in the same for if you're typing into Gmail, uh, systems will kind of finish the code for you, saying, oh, you're trying to do that. What if you did it this way? And that's, uh, this is kind of an older version now, but that's uh, a kind of promising area of research as well. OK. Now, has anybody seen this image? Interesting. OK, cool. Um, so. We've talked about, or I've talked about signatures, right? And I've talked about synthetic imagery. I've talked about synthetic text. What if you took the signature of a kind of famous luxury brand, in this case, Balenciaga, and tried to kind of distill its essence into code, and then combined that with, let's say, Harry Potter? What would you get? Uh, and this is the answer to that question. You are Balenciaga, Harry. <laughs> There is no good and evil. There is only Balenciaga. So, so what you're seeing here is basically the future of memes. Um, Balenciaga's uh, campaign on YouTube of their latest release got, I think, three million views. And this got, last I checked, something like nine. And this was not asked for by Balenciaga. This just happened. 
uh, and was done for every piece of major intellectual property you can imagine. The, the cast of Game of Thrones and all the Marvel you know, characters, Breaking Bad, were all done up uh, in Balenciaga. And um, this idea of kind of asking machines to riff on intellectual property is very much going to be, I mean, I think it's actually why the metaverse existed. I think that's why Mark Zuckerberg has, has tried to kind of push that path because it creates these weird kind of uh, mixes of intellectual property that, that we need both, both a venue for and, and adequate legal structures for as well. Okay, so moving through the kind of uh, uh, generative media, I want to go to now the simulation, not of uh, fictional uh, characters, of, but of, of real people. Um, this, this, what I'm about to show you, went viral uh, earlier this year, and it's a clip of a song by Drake that Drake had absolutely nothing to do with. So I'm going to play it for you now. So the crazy thing about this is it's pretty good. Um, this has uh, sparked major debates between uh, music publishers and the tech industry. They are kind of trying not to go to war with each other because we don't yet know in terms of copyright law what the right action is here. You know, it's sort of like you could argue, and this is what the tech industry would argue, a cover band, you know, uh, and you cannot own the copyright to a voice. And so there are arguments that, you know, this is just a part of our future and, and artists will have to get on with that. Equally, uh, YouTube and, and artists themselves are saying, uh, or sorry, artists themselves are saying, and the, the publishers, hold on, this, this, seem, like, this will demolish us. How could we let this be the case? Um, if you've heard of the, the name Grimes, this is one of Elon Musk's uh, uh, previous partners and is a musical artist herself. She set up a publishing company where she says, you can use my voice and anything you create, we split the profit 50-50. Uh, and so that's her kind of new publishing model. Uh, you know, it's hard to say which way it'll go. Right now, to my understanding, Universal and YouTube, just as one kind of uh, measure of this, have set up their own agreement uh, where they have said in kind of a backroom deal, this is how we'll, we'll figure out how to uh, cut up the revenue from this. But, you know, your favorite song in the next three or five years may not have been written by the artist that you love. Uh, and it's sort of a strange uh, world. Now, one of the things I should add is that in Grimes' list of uh, don't, she says, I not, uh, you can't sing about Nazis. You know, you can't sing about stuff that I wouldn't want my uh, brand attached to. Uh, but policing that is, is, is not a straightforward problem. Okay, so this is where things get really strange. Um, we've talked about synthetic imagery and uh, uh, music, uh, voices, uh, graphics, and the like. What about synthetic data? So if you've used Google Maps, you're very familiar with this, what, what I'm about to show you. It's the kind of step through of, uh, in this case, you know, a, a children's playground. You're maybe looking for someone's house, and you're trying to figure out by moving up and down Google Street View where, where it is. And the team there thought, well, what if we actually can, it, like, is it not possible to have the, the, these models kind of fill in the blanks for us, autocomplete for a database or a data set that we don't have everything uh, uh, kind of recorded for. And so what we get is a step from this, this kind of blocky, uh, low resolution piece to something much more fluid. And, you know, if you're working on autonomous vehicles, this becomes quite interesting because you can start to model a busy area like downtown San Francisco and take you know, pedestrians out, or take cars out, and dogs, and really everything to, to try and improve your kind of bedrock or baseline knowledge of, of what that sphere looks like. And I know that for you guys, or I would, and I would think that this is uh, also kind of a promising direction to get a sense of a, of a place at low cost by having the system fill in the blanks. Um, you know, uh, this went viral uh, recently, and the, the funny thing is, you know, they say your skills are irreplaceable, and uh, what I would say here is, you know, one of the things I've learned being in machine ML or AI kind of area over the last 12, 14 years is, you know, careful not to, like, uh, 
tempt engineers. Because engineers love a challenge. And if you say something like this, they'll say, OK, hold my beer. Um, and trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, and so you know, we are in the early days. You've already seen a number of examples profiled here of what this could be. Um, this is from uh, Autodesk University, uh, just an example of, you know, you, you take, I'm sorry it's low resolution, but you take kind of imagery, uh, remove, in this case, the scaffolding, and then color, you know, in yellow everything that's yet to be finished, in green what uh, is already finished, using the same ideas, right, of profiling uh, with this, the, the signature, what qualifies as a kind of completed uh, uh, build, <laughs> or what requires more work. And the team by that, behind that uh, project, which were called Scaled Robotics and have just rebranded as NASCA, I think, .ai, everybody's going AI, um, claimed that you know, in their build of the uh, Hong Kong airport, they had to profile 38,000 uh, uh, different components, and it was going to take a full team a year to do this, and they did it in two days. Um, so sort of going recalling to the, the waste management talk earlier today, uh, there is at least in principle the idea that we could streamline a lot of kind of corroboration of, of design quality. In my mind, to be totally frank, I don't know how, as with the ChatGPT example, if people are living in this, if these are value set, or if these are kind of, uh, you know, highly, if, if building, if it, the degree to which we can trust these systems is still being fleshed out, is maybe how I'll put that. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, in the spirit of kind of hold my beer, one of the ways we make a change here is to have better data. And so, you know, robots kind of running around your workplace or in, in different designs is going to be a thing if it's not already. Uh, equally, this is a group uh, called Versatile who have Crane View, which is this modular, this is just pulled off of their website you know, a uh, modular uh, video camera that attaches to a crane and monitors, you know, time spent in use uh, and other aspects of that environment from this kind of uh, overhead view in real time. And, you know, it's on the back of this change that companies like Caterpillar uh, uh, in, in construction are in, I understand, are increasingly describing themselves as data companies because often they'll have more information about a work site than the construction team because of the, you know, uh, 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 the, the different tools they have on site and maintaining you know, their own uh, machinery. OK, let's keep moving along here. People ask me what's the most exciting or the kind of mind-bending uh, example of, of what's out there. This is at least my current answer. And it's a team at DeepMind, which is bought by Google, based in the UK. And they want to, as you see here, close the reality gap. Uh, and that means in, uh, in effect, train systems in simulated environments and port that knowledge out of the simulated environment into the real world. So I'll give you an example here of uh, work from earlier this year where they trained these little robots who are designed to match these little off-the-shelf kind of prosumer DIY robots to, tra uh, to play football. And they got them to play football over and over and over again and to learn to stand and get up and to kick and to understand the basic rules, and then they ported it into the real world. And this is mind-blowing to me, because it's that sort of uh, kind of erzat experience, fake in experience in a sense, and porting that into the real world that, that allows us to get some of what the gains that we've seen in other areas of generative AI into the physical world that we live in, right? Uh, with with um, kind of bipod robots and, and things like that. Another major breakthrough, and this is from last week. They don't stop coming. Um, I have to give my slides in late anytime I give a talk because otherwise, like, something's happened. I haven't been able to include it. But uh, just relevant to the work that you do, also from DeepMind, was the discovery of uh, new uh, materials for the design of all sorts of things. But in essence, they developed a system that found 2.2 uh, million materials that humans have not experimented with yet. Uh, 380,000 of those are, are look to be are crystal structures that look to have some kind of stability, uh, which is very promising for the development of you know batteries and semiconductors and things like that. Uh, if you've heard, who's heard of graphene? So graphene is a very promising technology made out of carbon. 
to uh, improve all sorts of structures, and they've just found 52,000 kind of um, other similar materials. And this is on the front cover of Nature, which is the biggest uh, journal in the sciences. And it, it's, I think AI in the sciences is the thing that excites me most. It is, it is not a panacea, it will not do everything for us, but it, it, in terms of kind of discovering things that we can then go on and corroborate is a very uh, exciting area. Uh, also somewhat relevant to the work you guys do, this is a team at the University of Cambridge that were uh, tasked with identifying on behalf of, on behalf of local municipalities uh, poor heat retention in different building structures. And so they created these heat maps looking, or using data that combined you know, uh, uh, Earth observation satellite imagery in a sense and looking for you know, vents, you know, really high detail uh, uh, answers to these questions, doors, windows, and they combined that with the kind of uh, the ratings that you need in the UK for energy certification uh, to start to, in their minds or in their description of this project, make it kind of off the shelf for people at the municipal level to, to say, yeah, you, you have to improve your uh, energy retention in this building. Um, okay, so those are some kind of pie in the sky examples. Just to give a kind of lower example, which is somewhat AI, it's more on the kind of autonomy area, but this is you know, to replace valet, human valets with machine valets. Uh, and this is in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and just another example of what may have been extraordinarily expensive in the past, but is getting cheaper as this kind of, uh, these new benchmarks are, 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 are created. Um, equally, this is a favorite. This is instead of uh, using uh, herbicides in uh, the foods that we eat as they're grown, using uh, uh, micro-targeting lasers. So the laser here, you can see it zapping uh, weeds as they grow, uh, and it means that we don't have to use chemicals that then we consume or birds consume or other animals that we eat consume. Uh, and their tagline is smoking weed. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's sort of a fun, uh, a fun development. Um, okay, so I said at the top that um, you know, Nick Bostrom and this, this kind of intelligence explosion story is, is inadequate for the moment that we're in, and I, I stand by that. Part of it is, as Jack Clark, who uh, uh, runs Anthropic, which is uh, Chet, or OpenAI's competitor, that whole squad moved from OpenAI to Anthropic, uh, he describes it as the kind of capability overhang on synthetic media and multimodal AI. Just to, to come back to multimodal AI, that means when you're using kind of multiple uh, format simultaneously, as, incidentally, we do. You know, there's a reason that your, your chat bot, or if you're talking to Siri or something, part of the reason it's no good is it can't see you. It can't, uh, it's not in the same room with you, so it doesn't use the things that humans use to understand one another. We don't just listen, we smell, we see, we do all these other things. And multimodal AI gets a bit closer to that, and it is this year, well, it'll be in 2024 that multimodal AI will be on available to you, that you can take a picture of, you know, someone's done this on Twitter recently, this massive kind of rules about parking in San Francisco and say, am I allowed to park here or not? And say that to the system and it'll say, yes you are, or no you're not, and it'll kind of talk to you by combining speech with imagery, et cetera, et cetera, and with the logic kind of behind that. The capability overhang is the strangeness of being in this position where we don't know all the different ways this can be used. And this is why I think the quote unquote intelligence explosion is inadequate because that treats AI as a technical system and it's actually socio-technical. It involves us, right? We are components in, we, it, we have to kind of use these systems in creative ways. And that's why I describe it as a kind of creativity explosion because as you just saw in the previous session, People uh, will use these tools to do things that were previously unimaginable because we are adaptive and creative and so nobody really knows exactly what will come. Another reason this is important is, you know, much was made of the fact that ChatGPT became, you know, the, the largest uh, used piece of software in five days at 100 million users. I don't buy that story totally in part. If I have a laser here, I think I do. Well, it doesn't do much. But the, the, the difference is, you know, this is 2022. The world has changed a lot since Netflix launched in 1999, right? And so the socio actually matters. Uh, if you want to understand AI, you have to understand our imprint on it, how humans are. 
And that leads me to uh, a kind of brief comment on the other sets of considerations that are inevitable here in some, respect, in some respect, which can be summarized with this adage, you know, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. And when you invent electricity, you invent electrocution. Who here is an engineer? Who here uh, in their training as an engineer had someone kind of encourage them to <laughs> manage the safety of the work they do? You can put your hands up proudly. You needn't be shy. The, one of the differences between the engineering that you guys do in the world and data science is anybody can do data science. You don't need to necessarily go through, uh, you know, you can be self-taught. You can be self-taught in, in other areas of engineering as well, but they, they, there isn't a kind of code of professional conduct as there is for lawyers and doctors. And so, you know, we are, we are uh, a little kind of uh, cautious about what could come next. Um, some of the areas that we're seeing challenges already is, you know, uncertain quality of the output. I've already alluded to this in terms of, you may be familiar with ChatGPT giving you just a kind of inane answer that makes no sense, uh, which the industry likes to call a hallucination. My answer to that is anything that you wouldn't want a human who, who's hallucinating to do, I wouldn't ask a system that's quote unquote hallucinating to do. But you see this with you know, uh, the law, law society in New Zealand were among the first to get a call saying, What's, where's this legal case? We'd like access to it. And they say that case does not exist. And it, it, it came to be seen that um, ChatGPT had just made it up and made it look real. And that's the kind of adage of garbage in, garbage out. Um, this is an example of a model mistaking, you know, a sleeping beagle with a toasted bagel um, or, you know, a, a chihuahua, adorable chihuahua with a blueberry um, muffin that because these systems don't actually know anything, it's also been described as kind of um, mansplaining as a service that, uh, that sometimes it can very confidently give us the wrong answers on things. <laughs> And so we, are, we, must, we, we must be attentive to that reality until at least some of it is improved uh, with kind of ingenious modes of engineering. I'm bringing this to a close now. Uh, another area of concern is unquality, or uncertain quality of ownership. Uh, the Writers Guild of America has, has uh, gone to war and just won to their credit uh, permissions or, or uh, kind of entitlements around their use of their likenesses or their material and protections. Equally, you know, Getty Images and, and uh, in, you know, sole programmers in certain cases are, are fighting back about, t t fighting tech companies to make sure that they aren't kind of uh, uh, extracted from unfairly. And another concern is about liability. What happens if a system defames you? Who's responsible? Uh, an Australian mayor is actually suing uh, ChatGPT over this because it said that he was a criminal when actually he had been the whistleblower for the crime that he was by the system accused of. So where does this get, of, get us? I said at the top that I was starting kind of in the middle of the story. And this is where I want to give you the beginning of, of at least my journey into AI, and then I'll let you go for lunch because I know it's, it's that time of day. But, you know, I, I, I've had a very weird road to AI. Um, when I was 17, uh, my brother's good friend passed away unexpectedly. He drowned. And, you know, I don't know if you've lost anybody. If you lose someone as a teenager, this is one of the first people that was close to me that I lost. And it just broke my understanding of what life was about. Like, it made me think about how finite and how delicate it is and how kind of momentary this whole thing is, right? And off the back of that, uh, my brother and uh, my friends from high school, we were teenagers, started this project about things to do before you die. We thought we'll do this for two weeks, you know, in between jobs in the summer, and then we'll, we'll go back and live our lives. And it ended up hitting a nerve with people in North America. I'm Canadian. And it, we did it for a decade. I spent much of my 20s doing this project. We got to do all sorts of extraordinary things. I got to play basketball with the president of the White House. Um, I got to sneak into the Playboy Mansion, um, <laughs> deliver a baby. Uh, uh, this is things that we thought if, 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 if we were going to die, this is everything we want to accomplish. And for everything we got done on our list, we'd, we agreed to help a stranger do something on their list. So that's what we did. We, we you know, met a guy on the streets of Dallas, Texas, who hadn't seen his son in 17 years, homeless guy, and we helped him find him. And they've reunited and are actually still together today. 
And it was, it was a very enlivening project. It made me feel like, you know, I was spending the time that I had really purposefully. And I say that because there are two takeaways from that project. You know, one of the reasons I'm in AI is I'm ambitious and I love how ambitious the field is. I love the idea of what we can do with it. But the two takeaways from the initial project about things to do before you die is we heard from young people primarily, it became a show and a best-selling book and things. We heard from young people, but not exclusively young people, everybody of different ages actually, about purpose, right? People want to feel like they're doing something. And I see that in this room today that KEO, you guys have tried to underline like, let's make this count, right? Let's make this worth our time. The other thing that people said to us is pause. Because we live in a world today that everything moves really fast and it's like Ferris Bueller. You know, you can look around, or if you don't look around once in a while, you can miss it. The time your kids grow up, you know, life goes kind of charging forward. And to end this, what I want to encourage you to think about is, is kind of an unconventional idea in relation to AI, is that in relation to AI, purpose and pause may actually be the same thing. And the metaphor I give here is if you grew up playing music, you know that there are notes and there are rests. You need both. If you didn't have rests, it would just be cacophony. You have to build in restraint purposefully to make the, the things that you know, take our hearts away when we hear them. We have thus far in the history of computing built primarily with notes. We haven't tended towards restraint. That's about to change because AI is going to be with us in very peculiar ways. And the reason I underline this for you guys is because the, place, the, 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 the ways in which this will be experienced are in the places that we inhabit. Because you know, our, our online lives were often just at the computer. But in shared space like this, you have the opportunity to do something which is to bring people together for kind of shared pause, right? And shared co-enjoyment of a space. Now, when I say that this is going to be kind of happening with or without us, or, or kind of compelling us to, to think about this the way that sustainability has been put on the agenda since the 1970s, like what I'm describing is going to unfurl, I think, over the next decades, we see that like, there's all these pseudoscientific ways to use AI. You can take a screenshot or a photo of this if, you, if, you're, if you're inclined. This is from a group at Princeton saying, you know, the idea that we can kind of predict what a crim who a criminal is, there's no scientific basis for this. There's going to be some real strange uh, uses that society will have to kind of legislate around. And they're starting to, this is a, a kind of draft from the EU's AI Act saying, you know, things like social scoring, just actually the science of it isn't there. It's not backed. And it too frequently becomes kind of authoritarian or even fascist. So we, we definitely don't want that side of of these uh, uses, and we, we may need to collectively, in, in countries and nations, kind of pro, or protest and, and, and push against that, legislate against that. The other strange thing, and I'm, I am genuinely just at the end here, is we are beginning to see consumer preferences that there's kind of like a point of digital saturation where it's not worth it anymore. So, you know, this is the automobile industry realizing that people don't actually want like a television next to the steering wheel. Right? They like knobs. They like the feeling of agency. Um, and equally, young people are getting really fed up with online dating. So this is just generationally there's a shift. This is what's called the pair ring, which is to do the opposite of the wedding ring, to say that I'm, you, know, you can signal to the world that you're single, and you don't have to go through the, the kind of gauntlet of swiping and, and having like a second job trying to meet a partner um, as, that, as the, that tech industry tries to solve this is an analog solution to what could be put as a digital problem. Equally, you know, there are, there are calls now because of limited lithium reserves around the world not to do fully autonomous vehicles because we may only have enough uh, lithium for really autonomous transit. And that's a better use of, of, of this tool. So, you know, as we've heard today about uh, sustainability in AI, MIT's Lawrence Lab has just actually predicted that 20% of global electricity usage will be on data servers by 2030. That is insane to me. Uh, and you know, other considerations about sand reserves, silica sand and things like that, you know, that, that, that a, climate will shape AI. That's the TLDR here. That's the shorthand of what I'm trying to say. 
But you know, I, I really, I'm going to conclude here. Uh, sorry, I'll just actually share this slide. I forgot. The, uh, machine learning as a sector is comparable right now to the airline industry in terms of its, of its uh, footprint. So it's, it's unfortunately happening quite quickly that, that these systems, is just a, that's a kind of small transformer model uh, and the amount of carbon that it uses. So to conclude here, I just want to say, you know, AI will seem scary, but at least from my seat at the table, you know, I teach a master's at the University of Cambridge to, on AI ethics and society. My students are at these big companies. The component that won't change is the human. And you guys work with humans day in, day out. So just try and keep that close to heart as you figure out how to use these tools and think about the ways that we maybe choose not to use them and be inventive and creative there and pathbreaking there so that our kids have the, the kind of uh, joys of growing up not constantly kind of surrounded by AI but in some sort of happy middle ground. Um, yeah, I hope that's informative and I'm happy to answer some questions, but thank you so much for, for letting me be here. Are you okay? So if you have any questions, you can just raise your hand and Jack will run up to you with the microphone and then you can ask it. a lawyer on Clifford Chance from Clifford Chance on Bloomberg talking about regulations that are coming for AI. And I just, what are your thoughts on this? Because without being cynical or, you know, thinking the world is going to end, I just, you know, okay, the EU might put down some rules, but meanwhile, there's going to be a bunch of researchers in China who are just not going to care. And if it isn't researchers in China, it's like some guys in Kyrgyzstan with a laptop who are going to, I just, are we fooling ourselves thinking that we're going to legislate or regulate what is, seems to be like an unbelievable tidal wave of technological evolution yeah. that's just going to kind of overwhelm us before we can even put any kind And how would you implement the rules? So yeah. anyway, without sort of doom and gloom, what, what, how are you guys thinking about it? Because that's obviously the space that you're in. It's a great question. So the EU AI Act first, um, everything was kind of going on track. The EU you know, sees itself uh, next to China, next to the US as leading the ethics, you know, if, if uh, that will be the, the European kind of uh, 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 way to have some sort of competitive advantage. And indeed, you, you hear about the Brussels effect, which is whatever uh, the EU adopts in terms of digital policy. Other uh, nations follow suit because it's easier. It harmonizes expectations. And so Facebook or Google say, you know, okay, we'll, we'll go along with it. Well, sorry, no, they don't, they only say that after they've paid, you know, 200 lobbyists to water it down uh, as best as possible. Um, I said everything was on track. Just to finish the thought on the AI Act, um, that was until really recently when Germany and France said, hold on, we are potentially going to be limiting our own competitive advantage just on the technology. And so, Everything's. I was actually looking at my phone. It was a tweet ten minutes. Well, now maybe an hour ago, about whether the 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 act will be derailed or not because of this kind of want to keep the the market open. There's a funny set of things happening um, here. One of which is the real ownership of AI isn't necessarily being open AI and having you know your own tool, but it's to own the ecosystem. You want developers building with your core technologies, right? That's the win. And so what you're seeing now is Facebook uh, had one of their initial models leaked. And uh, well, supposedly, we don't know. Uh, but it did leak. Uh, and it went around the web. And it's a sophisticated tool. And Facebook, after that, in recovery, has started to say, that's okay. We want to be. Uh, we want an open source environment where you know we're feeding developers out there in the world to do all these creative things, and they're kind of the engine behind this creativity explosion. The trouble is that their definition of open source is not uh, what people who work in open source and the and the areas that kind of um, uh, monitor what that term means agree to. So it's it's disingenuous. Basically, you follow the money. The, the, I guess I'm trying to break the spell of the idea that open source will be some kind of um, balm here. About the uses, I mean, one positive here is that people felt this about the internet initially. They thought, like, what if kids go on and find out how to make bombs? 
and it, 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 for whatever reason, it kind of comes down to your feeling of, uh, of humans. Like, can we trust one another? Um, and, you know, there will, be, there will be bad actors, and we will try and regulate against them, but all in all, you know, we hope that things could go well just because we all have a kind of collective stake in them going well, and so we try to culture that to our kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other than that, yeah, there will be some serious challenges, um, you know, and I think that's why, and I, know I don't think this, that's one of the reasons I've been taking up this kind of balanced approach about not going full bore into AI. I encourage organizations actually to have a decomputerization statement now to say, like, stripped of all the digitality, what are you about? And put it down in a, in a document, because I just think, I just think this kind of, um, you know, uh, craziness will die off, these things will become normal to us, and we'll still be stuck with the same problems we have today, which is how do we coexist. Now, a final kind of point on that, which is uh, unfortunately a kind of a challenge, is the, the, to understand the future of AI, another way you can look at it that I've written about is to understand the history of corporations. Because corporations are in the eyes of the law, in many countries, people and we treat them like people. I talk about Google, and, and you may receive that information like with some kind of expectations that it's got a personality, right, that's, that's reliable, as opposed to just being a corporation. And AI is going to hack, is going to kind of elevate that um, challenge to the nth degree, because one of the big use cases that all of us will see, I anticipate, in the next one year, but probably three years, is a, a personalized chatbot or an assistant, an AI assistant, that you will be incentivized to tell everything because then it'll just be more useful to you, right? It will need your calendar. It will need to know what your birthday, your kids' birthdays are, um, what's going on at work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this just adds to, you, you kind of take on a bit of vulnerability there because if, if the system is uh, poisoned or if it's, uh, uh, you know, you avail yourself to manipulation and yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. It's something we're trying to fix. It's something we deal with day in, day out. But I, as with climate change, I think it's going to take time to start to see the structural changes. One thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll stop because it's a long answer, is competition never hurts. And I think these big, comp these big tech companies, we do not benefit from having them be that big. So I think it's going to be, I, I, I gave a talk like this at Davos saying, like, we all have an incentive in challenging the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, and you should look for solidarity there to, to push back on that and let the markets do some of the work. Sorry, okay. Hi. Uh, you've mentioned earlier an example about false information that you get from ChatGBT. So as individuals, uh, how can we actually validate or, or check those uh, answers just to make sure that we're getting the right ones? Yeah. And uh, one, one second question as well. Uh, I believe you have ChatGPT on your phone. I don't. You I don't. don't. I, I don't. I wouldn't put it on my phone, but I have Claude, which is Anthropic. So I'm just trying different ones out. So which application do you recommend that we should install? <laughs> <laughs> I should be getting an Amazon affiliate link here and get some sort of. Uh, so ChatGPT is not currently taking premium accounts. Um, you can't pay for their improved version. Uh, Google's Gemini, which uh, you, you would experience in text through as Bard, um, is the one that launched last night. One of the reasons that Google's rushed to do it is because of, did, did you guys hear about the craziness at OpenAI? Um, their CEO was kicked out and then brought back four days later. Very strange. That's a whole thing I won't go into, but um, Google, at least Google is liable, you know, uh, and some of these other kind of smaller operations may not have a legal, as significant legal department. It kind of depends on what you want of it, and I think that leads to your first question, which is how to kind of corroborate what it's suggesting. Um, I wouldn't ever rely on it. I, I myself would never rely on what a chatbot tells me de, de facto. Um, I would use it to kind of understand where I could look elsewhere, but. You know, that's the challenge, I think, is it, it simultaneously like solves a bunch of problems and then doesn't. <laughs> and so it's like a genius that may also be stoned or something and you don't know whether to trust what they're saying because, you know, uh, just for lack of a better analogy, it's, it's both things at the same time and that's a strange, a strange situation. But it's also really early days, right? Like no, no one in my world expected 
LLMs to be consumed, like to have ChatGPT out in the world as quickly as it's come. Um, but part of the OpenAI drama was to do with the safety implications of that. So we may find that these companies face massive lawsuits for for going out with like, you know, if a Microsoft, if a if a if a microwave explodes in the kitchen, that company's at fault. We are we are allowing these guys to kind of test in the wild in ways that are pretty dangerous. And there are 3.5 billion people going into elections next year. So it's, it's showtime for the realities of this stuff, unfortunately. Um, and the best thing I can say to you is just, you know, take it with a grain of salt and learn for yourself like what it's good at and what it's not, because it's not going away. Yeah. There's another question here. Uh, or, sorry, yes. Um, can you give us, uh, uh, explain like I'm five, uh, how AI works? Because <laughs> sure. I feel like we've been talking about it for the past two days and I don't really know what this would be a really this I would I would put to chat GPT uh, like that is the sort of task it's good at um, so that's an experiment but a couple things so I, I want to take the question and segment it into different answers um, if 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 chat or if AI is the rocket data is the rocket fuel so uh, and this has really it's a long story to do with the history of AI but we have not got systems that are smart on their own. They are smart because we have the internet, primarily, and because you have a smartphone in your pocket. So, you know, techniques that were invented long ago are suddenly of new use because we are just flush with data, right? And so it is to, okay, so that's the first thing is, you know, the data piece is kind of a critical component. Now let's move to the kind of inference uh, engine. The, the tools that, that are being used are basically kind of pattern recognition on steroids. A simple way to think about it is like, what could a thousand people in a room do? You know, uh, but it does it quickly. And it doesn't, it's, 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 mis, it's kind of a misnomer to describe it as intelligent or learning or to even anthropomorphize it, treat it like a human at all, because these systems are not like that. Google wants you to think they are. Microsoft wants you to think they are. This is the, the category er error I described before where they, they make a lot of money and earn your trust by saying, oh, this is like a human, but it's just statistics. And it doesn't actually know anything uh, other than just what comes next in this sequence. Um, yeah, and then generative AI is, is using this kind of prediction engine in, in the examples I've given, for instance, um, to cook things up. You know, so it, it's, it's kind of like uh, asking it, as I said before, with those faces, you know, if I asked, if I showed you a million faces and then said, make me a face, what would you make? And we saw there the, the, the iterative improvements of, of saying, well, two eyes, a nose and a mouth, and then as it's getting better and gotten better and better, you know, stubble or, you know, uh, an earring and, and higher fidelity uh, um, examples. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll stop there because it's there's more to say, but I don't want to go on and on. Um, yes, or sorry, I don't I don't know if there's a mic out there, but yeah. Just think, thank you. Um, I'm asking you more a personal opinion. Sure. Uh, since you are exposed uh, pretty to everything that is AI and advanced, and you are in closed rooms, uh, we are working for a better future. Uh, everyone in this room, definitely, they are aiming towards that. Um, and I'm most probably all the institutions that are promoting the apps or creating apps, they do it for commercial use. I want, if, if you can give us some insights for top three uh, apps that we don't know about or, um, you know, uh, some kind of development that are really going to be used for a better future, whether it is for climate, whether it is for uh, people, for social, for governance, if you have any input like that to, for us to, have, to open our eyes on them? Sure. So um, one of the high ups, I did, a, I did a stint at MIT, and one of the high ups there said to me once, and a, a very, it stuck with me, because he said, MIT's, um, they, they launched a mantra, which was uh, a better future. And he said, for who and on what time scale? And I think the, the, the situation we're in now is, is this, set of decisions about a duty of care because there are a group, a group of developers who say it's worth whatever the price is to get over this bump. 
I'm, I'm not convinced of that because I think there's a lot of salesmanship in, in, in AI and, and kind of disingenuousness. Uh, and a historical parallel here is the history of the printing press, if any of you are familiar. Obviously a transformative tool made books more accessible to the public. What people forget about that story is it took 400 years. And the reason it took 400 years is twofold. First, the price of paper had to come down. But second, critically, we needed mass literacy to be taught. We needed free access to elementary and high school education. And so what I say to my students is, what are the social innovations that will accompany these technological innovations? Like what needs to be true of the world for us not to worry as much about the bad outcomes? And at a minimum, what I'm arguing is, is rest. That like if people are overworked and underpaid and just stressed all the time, there's gonna be unnecessary kind of harms that, that could come from this. Now about the three cases that are positive, there are of course many uh, uh, kind of uh, examples. One, I think Earth observation, it's possible now uh, with satellite data and machine learning to uh, look at the emissions outputs of every factory in the world. We didn't used to have that data because companies or countries would lie, right? They'd be like, oh yeah, it's, it's this much, but it is actually this much. But you know, satellite imagery allows the measurement of, of, of output. So we are living in a kind of new level of surveillance where for sustainability purposes at least, uh, people will be able to call each other's bluffs. Um, now, uh, I also think that access to medical data and, inf and, and education will be kind of our promising areas that I teach at the University of Cambridge. I would love if uh, I could have a million students, but I can't. Uh, I can have, you know, 100 students at a time but you know, some of the material that we're getting, we can, uh, or some of these systems will avail education to young people. The critical piece here, and it's, it, I want to encourage you all, if, if you leave with nothing else, I'll, I'll put in your head the idea of sticking with the trouble. It's never, it's never, just, it's never just totally easy, right? We're still stuck with making tough decisions. And about education, like, we need education, and this stuff will allow it. But I hope that doesn't gut a lot of how we were educated, that you have time on the playground, you have things that aren't just about lesson outcomes, they're more like social learning. Uh, and that's where it's like up to us to invent things. And you guys have it, you're, you guys are, are all successful professionals in a big successful organization. It's time to be innovative and to think about social futures that are kind of worth memeing. Uh, and so I, uh, one way I say this to my students is, what's the better invention, the weekend or the internet? You know, because we forget that the weekend in parts of the world had to be kind of cultivated and, and, and formalized, and we could have new, new customs like that that give people back their time. Um, yeah. Are we at lunchtime, or is there another queue? Okay. Well, I'm going to stick around if you guys want to ask any more questions, and it's been a real treat to, to speak to you. So thank you again. Yeah.